So welcome, I'm Hina Shahid, your chair for this afternoon session. I'm a GP in London and also chair of the Muslim Doctors Association and Allied Healthcare Professionals, a voluntary organisation established in 2004, working with minority ethnic, marginalised and, commu and Muslim communities in the UK. Our work includes community outreach and engagement, health promotion and tackling health inequities, advocacy and policy and intersectional approaches to EDI in the NHS. I'm excited to have a fantastic panel this afternoon discussing the Manchester Muslim Medical Student Guide co-created by students and staff at Manchester University. Just before we begin, a few ground rules. If I could ask everyone to put themselves on mute, please, you're free to have your camera on and off. The chat will be active throughout the session, so feel free to use it to connect with each other, to share thoughts and any reflections. We will be following Chatham House rules um, for this session. Um, the first half of the session will be listening to the panel, panelists um, sharing their insights and experiences. And then we'll have about 20, 25 minutes or so for Q&As. And you can um, please put your hand up if you do have a question um, and you can put your microphone on, your camera on when you, know, when you are asking a question or you could just um, write it in the chat and we'll pick those questions up to put to the panelists at the section at the end. Um, as I mentioned, we've had a few requests for recordings because colleagues couldn't be here with us. Um, if you do have any ob objections to, um, to this being recorded or shared, then please let me know. Right, so, um, but, so firstly, um, I'd like to welcome Imam Muhammad Ullah, who is the Muslim chaplain to the University of Manchester and Manchester Metropolitan uh, University. He's involved in student welfare issues affecting Muslim students on campus and is co-author of the Muslim Medical Student Guide and he'll be talking about the background to the guide and some of his work with Muslim medical students. So over Thank to you. So Thank you Dr. Inna. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all I agree with the best of greetings in the Islamic tradition of peace. We start with the name of Allah, Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. So uh, thank you so much Dr. Hina and Dr. Inna for doing this and inviting us today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Muhammad Allah and I'm the chaplain here at uh, the University of Manchester. I also work at Manchester Met. I have to say that or I won't get paid, I think, at the end of the month. So I've been chaplain at the University of Manchester for nine years. And I know most of you are thinking, wow, I mean, why haven't you moved on and got a real job? Well, it's a good question, but unfortunately, as valid as it is, it's not in the scope of today's discussion. So let's take us back a little bit. I started studying at the University of Manchester since 2003. So I've been here half of my life. And it hurts me just saying that. Um, so I first studied law. And while I was studying, um, in my final year, I had a lot of problems. I was experiencing a lot of issues at home, issues to do with my faith. And there was really nobody I could speak to about it. And so it was fair to say at the time, I would say the University of Manchester um, and most institutions weren't really clued up on how to deal with students of, of a faith. And so it was left to student societies like the Islamic Society and people like that to kind of pick up the pieces. And um, it was actually a Jewish professor who was in, in, in my final year of law, who actually who understood my faith, understood why it was so important to me, and who actually came to my aid. He helped me. We, we, you know, we, 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 we were very, um, he was very kind of understanding about what my needs were, and he put me in touch with a few people. And I guess that's what always happens usually. In an institution, it's left to kind of very good staff members to kind of pick up the pieces. And so um, I then, in 2007, started studying Arabic and Islamic studies. I then happened to meet um, a chaplain who was the Anglican chaplain at the university. And then I realized that there was actually something about faith provision. But what was interesting was everything to do with faith at the university came through him. And he was very open about it. And um, the case was, so any issues to do with the prayer rooms, issues with Muslim students, medical mitigation went to him. And so he was a bit more, let her, as he would put it, a very kind of liberal Christian who was kind of very inclusive and he wanted a diverse team of chaplains. So he put together chaplains from the community and um, it was then that I started looking into what the job, job was. He kept talking about the University of Manchester being a secular institution and not really understanding what that meant. And so um, we had this idea that the university understood they had Muslim students and students of faith, but didn't really know what to do with them. So, you know, how do we offer support for them? And so and when I finished, I started working uh, voluntarily at the university. And then at the time, um, what we realized was anything again to do, with, to do with medical school will go to him. So the first thing I did for the medical school in 2012, I think all of this long, long time ago, was to do with mitigation. Anything 
that student wanted to do in terms of faith would mitigate and go to a chaplain but it was an anglican christian chaplain and so let's get to the first point that i want to make uh, very clear as a muslim chaplain as a muslim and they are oh a muslim colleague of mine said and oh but i thought and that they would always annoy me because then i was battling against the idea that i'm being asked to do something to do with muslim students but then i've been told oh but one of our muslim colleagues said this and so i was having to deal with that very early on in in my chaplaincy role and then i started to meet the students and then while i was meeting the students i saw that there was a lot of issues that they were facing that i was also facing i not knowing how to get time off for friday prayers not knowing if they can talk to their lecturer about the prayer ramadan at the time was not as big of an issue because it was coming up to kind of summer but now it's becoming an issue and so we realized that the students were facing issues that i had always i had always faced but no one was doing anything about it and then fast forward slightly met dr inam dr inam i think we met with um, dr emma sagal and dr talat and we talked about some of these issues and we realized that they as the muslim staff members in their school were having similar issues we then started to meet with the medical school on a variety of issues and um at this point i want to talk about the equality act 2010 the equality act i would say is a double edged sword why because at the time i remember being a student we always thought that this would be kind of like the beacon the, the thing of hope that would make institutions workplaces understand faith but it did in some ways but in other ways what would happen is people would use it as like a shield and say things like well the equality act doesn't say state so i want to go back to a meeting that was had with the medical school in 2015 a very uncomfortable meeting i would say um i don't really want to talk about who was there but it was the chaplains and some of the staff members and this issue of muslims praying muslims going to friday prayers muslims having to not go to preston for example if there wasn't a mosque which suited their needs all of these issues were brought up and it started to get very tense in the meeting in the sense that i felt like i was talking to people who had no idea of what islam was and then one of the staff members said i will i have to ask you mohammed uh, the question i have is if these students are so devout is medicine the right career for them and i just was like what and i couldn't believe that uh, this kind of conversation was taking place and so i then had to defend the idea that there are a lot of muslims who are practicing and also are you know high up in careers consultants doctors and who understand how to deal with this but actually it's the university who don't really understand how to have this inclusive learning space and how is it that they need to and to be fair to the school after that meeting there was a few staff members who got in touch with me and i would say there's been a massive a massive change and so this idea that you know what well, the equality act doesn't say we have to was always kind of confusing it was quite saddening to me because we want to be a world class institution at the university of manchester most universities want to be reputable and we have students from all around the world and we're talking about reasonable adjustments here i would say if the students who are coming to the university asking for unreasonable demands i understand that but we're talking not about the women request of a small group islam is the second largest religion in the world and i don't not only work for the university of manchester but also mmu and while i was working with other institutions there was a massive a parity between how institutions looked at religion that it's fair to say that the university of manchester medical school have come a long way since then for example nawab they've moved the dinner kind of welcome dinner to nawab no alcohol where before it was very alcohol centric it's not in the evening anymore it's kind of in the daytime so the university themselves have understood there needs to be a difference in how they include students from learning so let's move on to why we they did this guide so all of these things were taking place in the backdrop of myself dr inam other staff members having issues with muslim students and what actually happened was i think it was a societal shift is a culture shift to say so we have the blm movement we have you know society understanding there's more need for kind of the minority groups but also a market shift in the medical school and a staff change as well i think the first point is that when we talked about this actually it's fair to say that this guide was talked about 7 years ago and someone very important to myself and many people on this call i want to mention dr abd rahman al bayouk may allah have mercy on him who has now he's he's died last year he was a, a huge member of the medical school at the university of manchester and a huge um help for myself at the university and a, and someone who was very interested in, in these matters and part of the islamic society as well and we were he was part of the initial fir- first focus group on what this guide needs to be about obviously things happened we moved forward and so i met aziz who was then the islamic society president and aziz when he wants to do something is very tenacious 
And so I go back to why do I do this job after all these years? Well, it's meeting students like him and the other students on this call who have a real passion and a, and a love for their faith, but also a, a passion and love for their, um, uh, for their profession as well. And they want to kind of marry the two where they can be who they are, but also be the best doctor as well. And so we decided to look more into meetings and look at making a guide. When we say guide, it's we kind of said, if I was a Muslim student coming to University of Manchester, I won't know who the chaplain is. Who's this guy walking around with sandals on? I don't even know who he is. Most people don't know me. They don't want to talk to their Muslim staff uh, members. They really don't want to know who they are. How can we then, then give them some help if they're going through medical school from the start to the end and kind of get support all the way, who do they need to speak to? Who is it they need to talk to? What support can they get? And so we decided to, se uh, to uh, separate the sections. The students will talk more about the sections. So before I end, I wanna talk about what it is that we can do. So the guide is only one part of this. The guide is only the starting point we feel. And so I wanna talk about how do we foster this kind of hope? How do we have an inclusive learning attitude? Well, my question is as institutions, ask yourselves, I know there are people from other institutions here. What is it that inclusive learning looks like? For me, it's about enabling the students who have an identity to feel they're able to have that identity and ask the questions without feeling scared to speak to power. And we have to have an understanding conversation. We're not here shouting and demanding the equality access this, this is what my rights are. That's never been the way to work things out. The truth is I've not got many talents in life, but one thing I have is very I'm diplomatic I can talk to different groups of people and bring them together and one of the most important things I think is that we have a reasoned discussion and a conversation the reality is we hear that people are fearful of having these conversations but at the same time we need to have space for them um, a really good example before I finish is uh, the dental school with Dr Rebecca Craven I found out that Eid uh, one of the two holy festivals in this in Islamic calendar one of the two Eids one of the two festivals was not able students weren't able to have time off and there really wasn't a reason why and interestingly, it was on the form. So it was on the form of the of the uh, leave request was if you have a festival like Eid. And I asked, why is it that you're not giving Eid? I had a relationship with the head of the school we went in. It was a two hour, I would say a very uncomfortable conversation. But it was that trust that we had built up that we weren't here to be labeling people Islamophobic or she wasn't gonna call me an extremist. And I think we have to take these kind of words out of it. We have to talk about how do we, as people of faith, talk to institutions that call themselves secular and then have an open discussion about how they will see the needs of their students and staff best being met. So that's my first thing. The second thing is this guide can be tailored to other schools as well and other universities. If anyone is interested in taking this and or supporting you, please let us know and we will be more than happy to come and talk to you about it and, and um, include you in this guide as well. And finally, I will end by saying it's been a real pleasure working with these students and they are a kind of beacon of hope and working with them is the reason why I do this job. And so we'll hand over to them. I wanna say a huge thank you. Any questions you have for me, please do let me know. I hope that gives you a bit of background about this guide and why we put it together in the first place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chaplin. And um, I'm sure you have a lot of talents, um, but thank you for giving that background to the guide, um, sharing your experiences, the, the great strides that University of Manchester has taken um, through your work and the work of the students and the faculty, so it's really great to hear. And I think um, it, that leads us very nicely onto the students and who have actually co-produced this guide um, to talk us through some of the important sections in the guide. So, Gina, you've just gone on mute. Sorry about that. Um, if I could please ask um, our first um, student panellist, Abdul Hadi Kabaji, who's a final year medical student, to talk to us about moving out of university, moving out to university accommodation and freshers. Abdul is a final year medical student at the University of Manchester, who's involved with the Student Islamic Society and other Muslim organisations across Manchester, and he is the co-author uh, of the Muslim Medical Student Guide. So Abdul Hadi, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hinnan. Thank you to everyone else who's joined us today and to um, allow us to speak about our guide. Um, just moving on from what Chapman was saying. So when, when this idea came about, we, we decided to create like a, a form that we sent out to all of our medical students, all our Muslim medical students, our current students, graduated students. And we actually asked them, what do they feel like the issues that Muslims or what did they issues they particularly had when they went through medical school? So when we went through this guide, 
maybe one of the other authors can share the screen to show the contents page. All of, all of the contents page is actually the issues that they said that they had and issues that we've gone through. And I can promise you that every year, I'm now in my final year, fifth year, every year I keep getting these same questions, um, whether it's from our course, whether from other courses in the University of Manchester, even um, people studying medicine in other universities. And we're all going through the same challenges and same different um, difficulties. So one of the aims for the guide was to actually cover all of these topics, first focusing on here in University of Manchester, but the, the stuff is very applicable to other courses in the university as well as other medicine courses in the UK. So um, starting off with accommodation and freshers in general. So um, a lot of the feedback from the forms was talking about um, that first semester when students come to university, there's a lot of um, anxiety and a lot of people just feeling anxious about that first semester that, oh, am I gonna have to compromise my faith when I meet the new student? Um, when I move into new halls, I may be away from family. Am I gonna have to compromise my faith? So um, a very big part of it was the freshers week and the freshers month um, and meeting new people. So we go through some of the common um, scenarios where students, can feel uncomfortable in if there's any alcohol or if there's any club environment. There's a very big, especially at University of Manchester, there's um, like the medical society, they, they have a very big campaign at the beginning of the year where it's, oh, let's go and um, go to this club or there's gonna be this pajama crew party or this bowling followed by a drinks and stuff like that. So it's um, a lot of students, majority of Muslim students, they either don't attend these events and therefore they don't get to know people on their course or they go there but they feel very uncomfortable so we give a bit of advice about the different um, ways that they can approach that and how they can um, speak to certain people as well as um, offer alternatives um, the next thing that i wanted to cover particularly was accommodation and i myself i um, i'm not from manchester but i um, i moved into halls in the first year and I can tell you that there is a lot of um, lot of different things that students will, especially Muslim students, will feel uncomfortable um, being in that environment. And um, in Manchester, we have um, a tower, we have Owens Owens Park and Owens Tower, which is a, a specific part of Fallowfield, one of the student areas. And honestly, that the stories that I hear from that campus, I personally would not have. I maybe I might have left university or out of think done anything to get out of it um, in the first few weeks like they have um, initiations and like taking shots from each floor of the tower um, there's lots of drugs involved and stuff like that and um, I personally know people who've they they've been tried to get out of that um, accommodation but they've had lots of challenge from the university um, about moving it because because that hall is um, it can be randomly allocated to you so if you're unlucky and get allocated to that hall then um, it's very difficult to get out. And some people might not even know that they have the opportunity to get out. So this was a question that I get every single year, like Abdul Hadi, I've, I've been allocated to this hall in Fallowfield. How can I get out of this hall? And um, there, is a, there, is a, there is a procedure in the university if you need to change halls, if you want to, um, for example, if you're in a mixed, a mixed flat with um, males and females and you want just a single sex, accommodation there is a possibility um, for it to be moved out and you just need to contact the correct people so thankfully the University of Manchester does have that but the guidance for it can be very unclear so um, we just try to shed light on that and make it clearer um, and then also there's um, we covered some of the other issues in accommodation and so if you do have um, a flat that you're happy with how do you deal with other people in that flat if they're cooking um, not like um, haram, haram items which are like forbidden items so if they're um, cooking any pork or if that you're sharing pots and pans or if they're drinking alcohol in your flat or in your room or, or in your kitchen um, how do you go about um, dealing with that and again this is lots of the advice here is from our personal experience as well as the experience of many other Muslim medical students across um, across the different year groups so that's the first part of the guide, the freshers accommodation that first semester. And like I said, in my first year, unfortunately, there are some people that do leave university, like 
they they drop out of university because they're not comfortable with the environment they don't think that they're going to flourish and carry on with their degree if that first semester goes horribly wrong for them they don't feel like they can last the five years so hopefully with that first part of the guide we hope to um, keep our muslim students in university and encourage them to um, to talk about the different issues that they have so thank you very much for listening to me speak today thank you so much Abdul thank you um, we have shared the link to the guide in the chat as well if you haven't um, had a chance to look at it and it covers all the different points about accommodation that Abdul Hadi mentioned and some really important points as well, especially around, you know, if it is a barrier that students are facing and keep in staying at university, it's important to, to look at how these barriers can be addressed. Next, I'd like to invite Aziz al who is a fourth year medical student at the University of Manchester and is also one of the co-authors of the Muslim Medical medical student guide. He is involved with the Islamic Society with OSIS North and a number of Manchester Muslim communities and youth organizations and he'll be talking us about the section uh, talking us through the section on prayer and fasting. So over to you. Uh, thank you Dr. Shahid and everyone else for giving us the opportunity to showcase the guide and have this open discussion. Um, so as you can see the guide is quite comprehensive, it covers sections on freshers, accommodation, modesty, welfare, Islamophobia, and we have a section on Ramadan and how to navigate the issues pertaining to Ramadan. However, one topic that we spent the most amount of time on, the one topic that took up the mo more space than any other topic in the guide, is actually the, the, the topic of prayer. Now, why is that the case? It's because as Muslims, we believe that it's a fundamental part of our faith. It's the second pillar of Islam, and it's something that we believe as Muslims, something that we'll be held accountable for. And for too long, Muslims, and in particular, uh, Muslim medical students, have faced issues with regards to prayer and the Friday prayer. Chaplain, like you said, he's been there for nine years. Sit down and talk to him, and he'll tell you hundreds of student case studies that have had issues with their prayer. Now, there are logistical issues that students face. Some of them, have, some of them are, like, unlike other courses with the medical school, and in particular pre-clinical years, attendance is regulated by the GMC so you can't just take days off when you have Friday prayer. Clinical teaching sessions are usually quite long and back-to-back uh, uh, -back. and again in Manchester specifically year three and onwards a lot of the TCD case discussions and the secondary component teaching happens on a Friday and often there are clashes with Friday prayer but the major issues that from our experiences I would say are that Muslim students lack confidence. When you are in a large group of medical students or when the supervisor is a consultant or a professor, it can sometimes be very intimidating to speak up and ask about prayer provisions. And as we know, the culture within medicine, it's all based around sign-offs and seniors signing you off so that you can proceed on to your next stage of learning. Now, again, for a lot of Muslim students, they don't want to be that problem student. They don't want to be the Muslim students that's sort of sticking out from the crowd. So confidence is a major, major issue. The second issue I'd say is empowerment. Medical schools and healthcare environments, I think, are not doing enough to be inclusive of Muslim medical students. Yes, like Jacqueline said, things have, you know, where they were and where they are now, they're much better. But I think more work is needed. You know, just referencing the story that he said that when these issues are brought up to senior supervisors, the response is, well, if you want to be devout, then you maybe you should reconsider medicine as a career choice. Or even just last week, uh, a friend of mine read the guide. He wrote up the email template that we spoke about and he contacted his administrative lead and the lead said, well, you know, Friday prayer is not compulsory. Teaching is compulsory. I expect you to see you at, at, at teaching. Now, what that does is that it creates an internal dichotomy that do I choose medicine or do I choose my faith? And the two, frankly, are not mutually exclusive. And the students were not here just to complain. We want to be part of the solution and we want to use the guide to educate students about their rights and to empower them as well. In the guide, we've spoken about the importance of prayer to Muslim students, arranging prayer times when you have back to back teaching sessions, arranging prayer during winter months. So the months that we're in now, sometimes a student would have to pray three prayers in the space of four hours. Um, we've collated prayer spaces at the associated hospitals and placements in Greater Manchester. The Friday prayer is important. And we've also come up with a template email that students can use to, to send to admin leads um, to give them that little bit of confidence and structure. But the guide alone it isn't, it isn't the golden ticket. We also need to work with medical school staff, with educators and supervisors, hospital deans, and to make them aware of the issues using the guide and to have 
discussions like this one about viable and tangible uh, solutions. And that's it for me. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aziz, for those really powerful words. Sorry about that, I just lost my internet connection there for a few seconds. Um, so my apologies. Thank you, Aziz, for those really powerful words um, and for reminding us that, you know, students are part of the solution but need to work together with faculty. Next, I'd like to um, invite Maliha Momo, who is a final year medical student at the University of Manchester, also one of the co-authors of the Muslim Medical Student Guides and she is involved in Manchester University's Islamic Society and other organisations in and around Manchester. She's also a weekend Islamic student studies teacher at one of her local institutes and she'll be discussing issues around dress code, so the headscarf uh, in particular uh, and also others. So over to you Maliha. Thank you Dr Shahid and thank you for everyone um, joining us during your lunch break. Um, I'm going to echo a lot of things that Aziz has already mentioned, um, but in particular lead to do with the hijab, the modesty, um, the issue with bare below the elbows and the beards for the brothers. Um, the entire guide is amazing, but this particular section of the guide is very close to my heart because it's not issues that just resonate within medical students. It's an issue that is problem and that's something that's echoed for doctors, for you know, the entirety of someone's healthcare um, career. Um, just before I begin, some statistics from research that has been carried out. So 56.3% of women who were surveyed felt that their religious practice in covering their arms was not respected by their trust. 74% of people were not happy with their trust BBE uniform policy alternative. Um, if we go on to the issue with COVID and the beards, then we have um, a recent study and research that was carried out with over 469 healthcare professionals revealed that over 74% of people said that they weren't given the opportunity to discuss their concerns regarding PPE. Um, and statements have been made such as, you know, I am a Muslim and I have a beard, but beards are part of my religious um, identity, yet I was forced and pressured to shave it off. So that's just a little bit of a background to kind of set the kind of pressure and the, um, like almost like the normative, like the stance that's kind of expected from Muslim healthcare professionals. Um, so why is this such an issue? So starting off from the beginning, the Muslim, like the medical students. So being a female myself, being a fifth year medical student who's gone through three years of clinical years now, it's, it's immense how much, how much of a disparity there is between trust, between hospitals, between yeah, between hospitals from trusts to, you know, from ward to ward. And why is that the case? The case is because there isn't that uniform kind of policy in place when it comes to the NHS dress code. Because if you look at the Public Health England's national guidance on dress code in 2020, it was revised and it officially states that uniforms may include provision for sleeves that can be full length when staff are not engaged in direct patient care. So if that but that's the national public health um, guidance. However, if you look at our local trust policy guidance, it differs from, I mean, I'm a Manchester medical student, so I can't, I can only speak for some of the trusts that I've looked into. So Salford, MRI, North Manchester, all the, every single one of their dress code policies differ. And that's just what to name four out of however many hospitals and trusts there are in the UK. So why does this become a problem? This becomes a problem because of this hierarchy that exists or within you know, the healthcare system. When you're a third year medical student going onto the wards and you're approached by the consultant or the nurse in charge who's telling you to you know, roll up your sleeve, um, you're not allowed to be wearing a long sleeve top under your scrub top, that student is put in a very difficult position. Even if you know, they know that it's allowed, how do they kind of have that discussion? So our guide, is, it's to empower, you know, we've written, how do you handle those situations? Have that discussion with um, the nurse and the consultant. 
However, it doesn't stop there. You know, today on the call, we have so many people in very high positions. And I think a request to you all would be, the student can only do so much. The student can only go so far. And, you know, what I'm saying, it differs from ward to ward. So we need action from the top. Um, I think all NHS trust equality and diversity steering groups kind of need to review that policy in place um, to kind of accommodate for the needs of not just medical students, but also healthcare staff, because this, like I said, this problem doesn't just stop with medical students. Um, if I go on to the, that spare below the elbow, even we've had recently, we've had a lot of emails about um, hijab in theatres. And again, this is research that has already been done and in the national public health national guidance it says hijab is okay in the theaters as long as it's um uh fresh like you know clean washed hijab that's been washed at 60 degrees then it's completely fine for you to be in the theaters however again we've had students reaching out um to the chaplain to um certain members of the medical school saying you know the consultant asked me to leave the theaters because it's either i take my hijab off and put a scrub cap on or I, you know, or else I'm not allowed in. And this shouldn't be the case. It shouldn't be a matter of having to choose what's your Muslim identity, holding on to that Muslim identity at the exp or be a medical student. Like they're not mutually exclusive. Similarly, obviously with the pandemic and COVID and the issue with fit testing. So again, the statistics are very shocking, but the a spokesman from the Department of Health actually released a statement saying there should not be any pressure for people to shave their beards. The policies and guidance are clear that individuals should always be offered alternative options. However, if we just look at our medical school and the alternatives that have been offered, it's very, very disappointing to say that unfortunately there just hasn't been the means. And again, I'm speaking from from a perspective of medical students. And at this stage, fair enough, you know, don't go into the COVID war, don't you know, step out, take take that absence, whatever it may be. But what happens when you progress through your career? What happens, you know, when you're a consultant, you're a junior doctor who's on the front line for so many like stories that you hear of consultants being, um, you know, like statements such as like I felt marginalized and looked looked down upon as a doctor who was either incompetent or didn't care about his patients. That's just not the case. Yet because they haven't been offered the alternative options, you know, they haven't been offered um, the like fit testing with the different size masks because again there has been a lot of case studies that have actually revealed that even if you just trim the beard depending on the size of the FFP3 mask it's been fine they've been passed like they passed the fit test um like yeah the fit testing um or the offer of respiratory hoods all of these stuff are alternative solutions however unfortunately we need a bigger movement for like we need action to come into place. Like all of these policies are in place. However, there's little that's actually being done to implement these said policies. And also I think the last thing I'll leave, with, leave um, on is the fact that we need change from all of these trusts. We need change from hospital deans. We need change from all of these different positions and um, people in power, just because obviously with the NHS system, it's not just based off the national public health guidance. Every trust, every deanery, like have has their own trust policy so yeah a student can go in and say okay but the public health england guidance says this but then this consultant can turn around and say but our trust guidance says this and that kind of leaves the student or the healthcare professional in a very sticky situation and that shouldn't be the case like it shouldn't be a matter of your muslim identity and you could, like your medical health um like whether you're a student or a consultant they're not mutually exclusive um that's it from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Malika. Um, and thank you for those reminders on you know, the need to really look at alternative options um, and explore them. Um, and also that although there may be policies and need to implement them and also make sure they're implemented consistently to reduce the variation so that people are not having unfair disadvantaged experiences just because um, a person might choose to, you know, to inter not even interpret a policy, but actually 
choose a particular course of action which actually is against the policy so thank you for those reminders um, and for our final student Sarah Bahadur um, if I could invite uh, you on please Sarah is a third year medical student at the University of Manchester also one of the co-authors of the medical student guide and will be talking to us about the very important issue of Islamophobia which ties into what some of the themes are that have been coming out already from previous speakers over to you Sarah Hey everyone, um, Um First of all, I'd like to thank you all for attending and taking um, time out. Um, so again, this might seem a bit repetitive um, from what the others have said, but Islamophobia is such an important topic for us as Muslim medical students and just Muslims generally to speak about. Um, so for myself, I've been involved in work that relates to Islamophobia and the prevent duty over the past couple of years. And what I found is that Islamophobia is something that is rampant on a local, national and international level, and especially within the NHS. And every single Muslim person that you come across will have either experienced, witnessed or heard of an Islamophobic incident. And there, there are so many stories whereby um, healthcare professionals have experienced things at work, such as being called a terrorist. They've been taunted about their faith and even some have feared for their safety whilst at work. And so we felt that it was absolutely vital to include this section within the guide. So um, in terms of the guide itself, what we've included is that when it comes to Islamophobia, what can it actually look like? Many things that can be said are things that actually stem from ignorance or genuine curiosity, and that is different to an actual Islamophobic attack or remark. Um, we also mentioned about the various reporting procedures that are um, on campuses, and this is something that is essential because, um, as he's mentioned earlier, something about confidence and empowerment. And many students don't know what to do when they have experienced Islamophobia or other forms of discrimination whilst they're on campus or whilst they're in a clinical setting. And, and the thing is, is that there are so many different procedures in place and support is available. It's just knowing how to access it and what to do and actually feeling that you're being supported during that process. The other thing that we mentioned within the guide was about speaking to the Muslim chaplain for any, for any issues that you may experience whilst at university. Um, I think what's really important for us to stress is that Islamophobia and other forms of discrimination are things that should never, ever be tolerated. And within the NHS, there does seem to be this culture of just brushing it off. It's part of the job, you know, just deal with it, move on. And that is something that should absolutely never be accepted. And so it's really important that Muslim students know what to do if they ever encounter any forms of discrimination and Islamophobia. And essentially, we want Muslim students to be able to feel empowered by their faith and flourish whilst they're in their journey at medical school in order to become the best healthcare professionals that they can be. And that actually starts with you as staff. So as medical professionals, as staff at your various universities, um, et cetera, it's really important, I think, for you all to be proactive. Maliha just mentioned that it shouldn't just be that the students are reaching out to you. It has to be also a top-down approach as well. So reach out to the Islamic societies that are on your campuses, speak to your medical students and other healthcare students about the experiences that they've had and what they think can be improved within the medical school itself. I think also it's vital to create environments whereby healthy and open conversations can be had um, because that can eliminate the ignorance that surrounds like uh, the ignorant comments and things and essentially we can educate each other and also ensure that you're supporting your students throughout the year. So currently it's Islamophobia Awareness Month. I haven't actually seen the med school talk about it or do anything about it. And I think it would be really like moving forward. It would be really nice to see that from the medical school and from the various like um, hospitals as well. So that, that Muslim students um, do feel that they, you know, are being recognized and that they, they are able to, you know, reach out and do things and, and people can learn. Um, so, yeah, so essentially, please make sure that your students know that Islamophobia and discrimination are things that should never, ever be accepted. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that really important um, section on Islamophobia and reminding us about how important it's not just for students to be able to recognise and report it, but also for staff um, and, um, and in medics to be able to respond to that appropriately to make sure that students do get the support that they need and to make sure that this doesn't that this doesn't happen um, on campuses and uh, in clinical learning environments. And there's a really good section on support and well-being that's also in the guide. 
um, which would be um, really good for students and staff to to look over and that brings us on to our final speaker who is um, a familiar face and voice to many on this uh, call today that's Dr Inam Huck. Dr Inam is a GP and clinical senior lecturer in Manchester and he's co-chair of the newly formed Medical Schools Council EDI Alliance which aims to improve inclusivity in medical schools in the UK. He's also chair of Ask Doc, which is a Manchester-based community organization working on health inequalities, and is also on the committee for DEMA, which stands for Diversity in Medicine and Health. So Dr. Enam, over to you. I think you're on mute. We can't actually hear you. Um, yeah, if you try now, maybe. I'm afraid we can't hear you, Dr. Enam. It always has to happen once, doesn't it? I know. Always. I know. Oh. In the meantime, if anyone has any questions that they'd like to um, put in the chat, um, and um, Emma's given some tips to um, to Enam about how he might be able to sort out his his mic settings. And just a reminder as well that the link to the guide is, is in the chat if you haven't seen it already. Thank you, Malia, for sharing it. And actually, I do want to, to comment on, on the last point about Islamophobia, um, because it is Islamophobia Awareness Month, and that's part of the reason why we're having the session today. Um, I mean, we've done quite a lot of work looking at the issue of Islamophobia in the NHS for healthcare staff, and certainly it is a really prevalent issue. But what we know is that, you know, it starts early on in medical schools, and it's really an issue that that needs to be looked at um, and and addressed early on, um, so that those compounding experiences that students and junior doctors um, and then GPs and consultants, and then through their professional development appraisals all of that you know it's it's something that that doesn't continue um to to intensify over the course of a doctor's career so thank you so much for that um for those reminders and and for the guidance in you know in that relevant section of, of the student guide and if anyone uh, yes oh, that's, working. that's working um, oh. sorry that's all right just saying and if anyone here is interested in um implementing the guide at their medical school, then please do, do reach out. Um, the email address has been shared um, in the chat, if, if someone wouldn't mind just sharing it again. Thank you. And welcome, Dr. Inam. <laughs> Real apologies for that. I was all set up looking really comfortable, but you know, the story of my life, <laughs> something, a curveball always uh, comes, uh, comes ahead. So thank you for persevering. Thank you to the uh, Muslim Doctors Association Hina for inviting us uh, to, to speak about the Muslim Student Guide. Um, and um, thank you to our chaplain and our medical students for uh, an amazing uh, uh, drive, an amazing vision to, to get this through. But I'd also like to thank the, the programme. And I think what I wanted to talk about is where we go from here and what, uh, what sort of examples of good practice is demonstrated by this work. And I'd like to thank the programme that uh, we've got a few of my colleagues here um, on, on, this, uh, on this call, because without the um, engagement of um, the, the medical school, it's hard to make a difference because when you're knocking on the door of a big institute um, and they're not going to listen to you, particularly if you're a student or somebody who's new as a staff member, then how are you going to change the environment? How are you going to make it more inclusive? How, how will you feel like you belong there? Um, when I was at medical school in the 90s, um, that environment did not exist at all. 
um, and I felt like I did not belong. Uh, there were some funny instances where there were some misunderstandings. Uh, for example, um, I was doing ablution, uh, which is uh, preparing for prayer, and a senior professor came in, and he was so angry with me when he saw me, you know, washing my hands and my arms and my face and things when, when he, he caught me in the act, and I couldn't explain it to him because there's no channels of communication there. So what my question has been tasked by Hina is, what can institutes, medical schools, pharmacy schools, dental schools, what can they do uh, to, to make an inclusive learning environment for Muslim students? I think the first thing is to listen. There were lots of things mentioned here, which my colleagues may find uncomfortable. Um, some of the issues, some of the concerns, some of the blatant Islamophobia. But I think we can't hide from that fact. We can't hide from what is the truth, what is the lived experience of students, where, where whatever protected characteristic they come from. Bearing in mind intersectionality adds to worsening um, outcomes as well. I think the main thing is to listen, um, not to interrupt, to under try to understand their, uh, the students and what they are going through, and then to try and find a way to to meet um, uh, and address those worries, those concerns, those things that are really making them not feel part of the medical school. We can't do much in Manchester for postgraduate because that's not where our remit is. But if we can instill uh, an inclusive learning environment where our students feel that they can be open and um, express their concerns without fear of uh, being labeled um, Islamophobic terms or, or being seen as a troublemaker, then I think we are on the right track. What the program and other institutes can do is, is to be open and review um, what their policies, their procedures are, and try to find out a way that, um, that meets the students without compromising the, the, the larger student body. It's to, to look at the guidelines, be culturally sensible, understand uh, try to understand with the uh, cultural humility that there is an opportunity here to make a difference, an opportunity to um, challenge um, the unfortunate Islamophobia uh, that is uh, quite prevalent in large segments of society. And as medical educators, we have a large population of Muslim students who are feeling alienated at the moment. What we also would, would want is that kind of collaboration in projects, collaboration in awareness raising, collaboration in, in creating these, uh, these documents to, to make this happen. And by doing it through this Muslim medical student guide, there is a, a cunning plan, as Baldrick in Blackadder uh, used to say, there is this cunning plan. And the cunning, uh, but the, uh, sorry, the students won't know what I'm talking about, but those of you a bit older will know exactly what I'm talking about, Baldrick. Um, the, plan for this is for a blueprint to enable inclusivity to different protected characteristics. An opportunity to showcase what can be achieved when students, staff, clinicians in the hospital, and also the patients, because that's the other important voice in the room. If we can get that collaboration and that discussion going, then we can make a more inclusive learning environment. Then our students do feel free to express their concerns. They know that when they report an Islamophobic um, incident, they don't feel that they will be reprimanded or silenced. I've gone through a time in, during the, uh, in the NHS when um, you couldn't report things. You were seen as a whistleblower. You were seen as somebody who's a troublemaker. If you wanted to, to get far in your career, you do not uh, rock the boat you make sure that you stick to the narrow plan um, and, and, and don't veer from it. But at the end of the day, if we're talking about the importance of the EDI, which the GMC, the Medical Schools Council have really put lots of effort into um, acknowledging the importance of EDI in our institutes. If we want to stand by this, uh, this, this, uh, this vision of an inclusive learning environment, then we do need to, um, look at this elephant in the room. We do need to tackle it head on. We do need to um, work collaboratively so that our students do feel they belong and they have happy memories 
of, of their time at medical school, happy memories of undergraduate um, education so that they can um, you know, go into their career as a doctor feeling more empowered, feeling happier, feeling um, that they can make a constructive difference um, as, as a doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Enam, um, for all the work that you've done with the students as part of the faculty um, and for all the EDI work that you continue to do in medical education. Um, you know, we're also grateful to you for that. Um, lots of, of really positive comments coming through um, from our attendees about the importance of this guy and how they're interested in taking it back to their medical schools and sharing the guide. Um, also, just reflecting on some of the the themes that have come through from all of the speakers, you know, the importance of listening and creating safe space to be able to hold any hold that discomfort that can come through with some of these conversations. Um, having cultural humility, um, allyship, and collaboration. This is not this is not something for a, a, this is not a burden that students who are already or may already be facing difficulties for them to bear on their own. And we we all have a part to play um, in in creating or co-creating these inclusive learning environments. And that's why we've called it co-creation because it's it's working together collaboratively. Um, I know Chaplin would like to come in and, and say something and he's been answering some of the questions that have been coming through in the chat as well. Um, yeah, so one of the things that has been asked a few times is about this, um, you know, how to take it forward and kind of the conversations. But one thing I think is really important um, about how we work with the school, obviously Dr Inam is our in with the medical school. I've been working with them on various things, but the truth is we had a meeting with them. Um, a few months ago and we weren't really sure and as he's phoned me he's quite dejected he's a bit upset he was the ISOC president at the time and he was saying to me you know it was how far are we going to get with the medical school I probably will be how, will leave before the they kind of accept this and I said you know what Aziz we've done something really positive here it's a really good resource there are a lot of Muslim organizations out there other medical schools that will need this I know that it'll save me from getting a load of questions in my emails and whatsapp so if it helps me even then it's a benefit and so we decided that we were going to push this and we worked really hard over the summer the students worked really hard to get this out in September which then gave um, other universities and um, so for example Edge Hill they we didn't even know this but a student that we know and is a friend with a few of us here he told us that his lecturer was giving it out in printed copies Birmingham University had looked at it so other universities had picked up on it before we kind of even properly got it out there but one thing I want to say to everyone here on this call is that as a chaplain it's easy for me to be like a, a, the Muslim I mean but then again it, it's not as easy as you think working in an institution of course I have my Muslim identity and it's easier for me to talk about Muslim issues however what we have to say is that writing this guide something came up quite a few times and I'm thinking that this might come up with other universities as well and it's this tension between the language we use so the idea that yes um not when we say that all Muslims, we're not talking about what Muslims do, we're talking about what Islam says. And it's a very fine line between having this idea that the tension is between, between being clear what Islam says on a matter and what at the heart of it we're trying to achieve. We felt in this guide, and this is very important, that by being authentic, we wanted to provide that clarity and certainty for both Muslim students and staff. So if we were clear about what we were talking about, it'd be clearer for you. So when someone says to you, well, Friday prayers aren't compulsory. No, no, we're saying, yes, it absolutely is compulsory. And so that's where the, the factual point is. How you choose to deal with it as an institution is up for you to decide. What we have to do is, by being uh, authentic, we also give the confidence to our students that they can be themselves and have a strong identity. And that is quite difficult about how you then say to a university, will you accept this as what Islam says? Well, we say this is what our religion says and we have to be authentic to that. Thank you so much, Chaplain, for, for um, answering those questions. Um, there's a question that's come through um, from Jonathan around anonymous reporting. Uh, and I wonder whether, Jonathan, if you're here and you'd like to um, just to clarify um, the question, if that's all right. Yes, absolutely. Uh, sorry about that. I was just typing a reply. Um, we have a reporting tool at the University of Birmingham, which I don't think had been used very much. I don't think it was clear to students that it was there. But we had a query about whether we could have um, an uh, anonymous reporting tool available for students, because some students don't want to put their name forward because of what might happen after that. Um, and my understanding is that legal services have told 
the equalities group at the School of Medicine and Dentistry that it can't be anonymous because of um, issues with fitness to practice and having to investigate. And I wondered whether there are anonymous reporting tools at other universities or whether it always has to be not anonymous, if that makes sense. Well, we have um, report and support at the University of Manchester, which I know is semi-anonymous in the sense that there was an issue this, that came up in earlier this year with tensions that uh, occurred in, um, well, the attack on Al-Aqsa Mosque in Palestine. And there was tension between Jewish and Muslim students and social media posts. And there were a lot of anonymous um, reports about that to the university from both Muslim and Jewish students, which then culminated into this kind of big thing. And I know that in some occasions where I was in kind of a, a student disciplinary hearing or, or a kind of meeting with the university, we weren't told who reported. So there was an anonymous element to it. How far that goes, I wouldn't be 100 percent sure. But there are I think most um, universities do have a, a report service, which is and the students unions. I know definitely have an anonymous reporting service for most universities. It just depends on the schools themselves. Dr. Inam, do you know about the School of um, University of Manchester? Is it anonymous? Um, I'm not sure. Um, there have been some comments, um, some replies that have come through from other universities um, in the chat. So um, Birmingham should also have it and students can report anonymously. I think there was a comment about Warwick and Manchester as well. Um, for the for the medical school, we have like anonymous concern pathways. So if there is some some issues there, um, we also have um, a, a special button. It's like a, a, a like a bat phone. Um, if there is a major concern, you can press a, an alert button. Um, we only recommend that in uh, major issues as well. Uh, but with the concerns pathway that we have in the medical school, rather than my knowledge of the university itself, um, yeah, we can look at um, the quality of placements, if there's any issues of discrimination. And then there is this anonymous support, report and support. Um, uh, and you, can, you can go through the, the main university processes for that. Okay, I'll, I'll check again at Birmingham. Thank you. It might be my understanding that's not correct. Thank you. Also, there's a comment here about Queen's. They have an anonymous reporting uh, system, but the medical school is resistant to this, which is um, which is interesting. Um, we also have a question from S. May how, how do you pronounce him? Sorry, S. Mahone. It's okay. It's the it's the worst name to have ever. Um, you did very well with it. That was lovely. Um, yeah, just to say that we have an anonymous. Uh, kind of feedback system really for students they can use it for uh, it's a bit like Facebook in that a student can put a comment up and then that comment is seen by other students and they can like it or not like it they can't and that isn't seen by staff and once that's gained enough traction within the student portal it's then flipped over into the staff portal for us to to deal with um, this session could not have come at a better time for for me. I'm from the University of Central Lancashire, Stephen Gallen Mann, um, because Friday prayers is, is has been raised as an issue um, by some of our students. So I am I am really relieved that the, the guide is now in my possession, and then that can go back, back and we can take some active steps um, to to make things better and to make things as they should be. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Just conscious of time, um, we'll, we've got another question up. Um, we'll aim to finish by five past, if that's why. I know you're very busy and you have to, to all rush off, but um, there's a question from Jay Lavin. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be quick. Just to really urge people um, in the clinical environment, you can certainly report anonymously any of these issues that you've described by the data set were in our trust it's the data system. Um, but I would really urge you to do that because that will then make it visible. And hearing comments that um, Sarah and um, Malia, well, all of you have made, that actually if, if there isn't an awareness of the organisation, of the level of um, difficulty and the frequency of the issues that you are experiencing and have described today, then it's really important to get that vis visibility. You can do that anonymously. So I, I understand the issue is about not wanting to be a troublemaker or whistleblower, but you can do it anonymously. 
And equally, I would hope that you would find allies in your undergraduate department. But, you know, please, please do report it that way. Thank you so much um, for reminding me about that. And I'm so sorry, but we've really got to wrap up. I know we could have lots of discussions and um, about the, the themes that came out of today. Um, there's a lot to take away there. Um, and it's been great hearing some of the work that um, medical schools are already doing or thinking of doing. Um, we've had such a great representation uh, on, at the meeting today. Just a reminder that if you would like to get in contact with the team behind the guide that you can contact them on muslimmedicalguide at gmail.com if it's something that you'd like to carry forward in your medical school. Um, we'll also be going through some of the comments that have come through the chat and the questions that we haven't had the opportunity to address. I'm really sorry about that just because we were really tight for time and we will be in contact with you um, for to, and, to, and to follow up on the event. So once again, thank you so much from all of us here, from myself, from the students, um, from Dr. Enam, from the faculty. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And hopefully we will be in touch to carry forward this important work around creating or co-creating inclusive learning environments for Muslim medical students, but also looking at other uh, minority and marginalized groups as well and how the learning can be shared and applied across those. So thank you so much from all of us. Has everyone gone? I think it's just us. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, I'm happy you. Everyone's, <laughs> everyone's <laughs> gone. Oh, gosh. No, that's what I know. That was absolutely fine. Don't worry. Um, yeah. We take the opportunity just to reflect a bit on Islamophobia and to talk about Islamophobia Awareness Month, which I okay. forgot to mention at the beginning. So, um, yeah, thank you for giving mm. us that opportunity <laughs> to just to was... have that. I got some new, he um, new headphones. Well, my other computer. Uh, died so did you see me frantically going on to another computer so, oh, so yeah yeah and then i was looking on another one anyway anyway <laughs> i think it's islamophobia is important it's interesting how they all kept talking about reporting because it's a lot more than just reporting islamophobia we all know that it's not as simple as just saying go report it it's about what's done afterwards what's the follow-up is there any consequences to the students there's a lot more but i didn't want we obviously had no time but what was really positive though is that about seven of them at the end said they want to do something, but three people messaged me privately saying that they would like help, that they would want to take it forward. Can can we support them on it? So I think this is what we initially intended, that this is like the kind of gold standard for future use. And uh, Dr. Shahid, you said that you're in, for Imperial. We've got an opportunity with Dr. Shahid to work for Imperial and get one out there. Oh, sorry, I forgot to stop the recording. I'm